recorded live. Welcome to the Virtualization Security and Cloud Podcast. Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast. We're going to actually rename this. Episode number 63. Joining us today is a distinguished group of panelists. Our first panelist is Eben Rodriguez, who consults with enterprises to assist them to secure and operate their virtual environments. Michael Berman is the CTO of Catbird, the pioneer and industry leader in security and compliance for virtual environments. Hemar Proffer Chandra is actually still out on, I believe, is she in or out on sick leave still? Um, either way, we wish her well, and hopefully she can join us at a future date. She's the CTO of High Trust and one of our static panelists. And myself, Edward Haletke, a.k.a. Edward Texiwell in the VMware Communities Forum, and author of the book VMware vSphere and Virtual Infrastructure Security, Securing the Virtual Environment, as well as the second edition of my ESX and ESXi in the Enterprise book. The podcasts are equalized by Tim Pearson and contributing author for the security book and owner of Data Century, Inc. Our special guest panelist this today is actually one I've been trying to get for a while. And his name is Simon Crosby. Simon is the founder and CTO of Bromium, who, where he, and he also was at Citrix, where you were the CTO of Data Center and Cloud Division. That's right. So thank you for joining us, um, Simon. Oh, good to it's a great pleasure, um, and, uh, and indeed to join such an august panel of experts. Well, we try to think we're experts. So um, what we want to do today is talk a little bit about cloud security, specifically I was trying to think about, since last the last talk we talked about platform as a service, I would like to talk about software as a service as well as some of the security threats against that and security threats against um, cloud in general. So why don't you take a couple of minutes. What's your take on the threat landscape and, uh, against software as a service? Are you asking me, Simon, specifically? You, Simon, specifically, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, let me place it all in context. I think that the, the big thing that's going on in cloud, as far as the enterprise is concerned, is mostly private cloud. And then there's this huge adoption of SaaS. That is, SaaS, there's a, a substantial traction in the SaaS environment. And, um, and broadly, you know, the adoption of SaaS from an enterprise applications perspective is important, but the other thing that's important about SaaS is that um, every one of their employees is wandering in with a smartphone, and every one of those apps you can think of as a SaaS app, and every one of those apps is running in the big public cloud in some sense. So security and the public notion of cloud is is uh, fundamental in the it, that is it is having a far more profound effect on the enterprise than. Um, than any other notion of security, and uh, and to my mind, that is also being driven very heavily by new client device form factors, uh, which are changing the the whole consumption of app and architecture of applications. So it's big, and it's scary in the sense that you know everything that the enterprise thought that it knew or had under control in the context of security, when everything was running in the data center, is blown away when it is no longer there, and. Uh, and that the challenges begin with identity, and they go downhill from there. <laughs> I, would, I would say that. So, what do you? What's the challenge with identity? Well, the challenge with identity is um, is that once the well, there are new well, there are technical challenges, but the, the, certainly from an enterprise perspective, if the enterprise is going to adopt an, a SaaS app, then um, that you know, what is the identity under which the employee gets access to that app? Ideally, it should be the enterprise identity of the employee, um, and so the key thing to protect against is that, first of all, the enterprise identity management system is not um, threatened by virtue of having to be exposed to the cloud. Um, second, that there is a, a way for the employee to authenticate themselves to the enterprise and then on the basis of that, to securely reach out to the SaaS application. Um, there is a provisioning issue around that, which is how do I get the identity to log in or the credentials to log in to, the, to that SaaS app? And um, then there is an issue related to deprovisioning, which is that if the employee leaves the employment of the, of the organization, do they have independent access to the corporate data once they have left? Um, so there are tons of issues that are all 
or hinged from identity, and, and that's identity parlayed into access and and the security of access to um, corporate information if it is you know if it lives out in the cloud. So you basically we're going back to authentication and authorization, but at a much finer level. It's, it's ID and, and authentic and identific identification, but also the fact that you know the identity uh, which I use as an employee uh, might never be exposed to me. It could be entirely artificially generated and and hidden from me, so that I don't have any way of in my personal mode as a, just a consumer of web apps, um, you know, going and logging in and, and snitching the, the company's data. So there is a big issue there around identity and federation of identity domains, provisioning and deprovisioning, uh, which I think is critical to the whole notion of broader adoption of of cloud-based apps by the enterprise. By the way, this is true, just as true if I'm using Amazon Web Services as if I'm using you know some hosted CRM solution. Absolutely. Now, what what you said was rather intriguing, and that is is that the user may not actually know his identity on such a web service web information, a website, whatever it is. It could be he doesn't know his identity on Salesforce, doesn't know his identity on Amazon, doesn't know his identity for whatever web application he's going for. Right. So now, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, is this type of, quote, unquote, not knowing their direct identity related to these chained attacks that we're having, the, the events, persistent threats that we're yes, going well, on now? Yes, yes. I mean, to my mind, it is, um, and I think that, that there are very substantial challenges there. I, to my mind, the identities need to be artificially generated and artificially maintained, and arguably periodically, you know, periodically changed out by the enterprise without the employee even knowing about it. Um, you know, employees are just, you know, we are just extraordinarily bad at, at managing identity ourselves as individuals, uh, and it's far better if we start to let automated systems do this for us. But if we use an automated system that runs into that whole automated system problem as well. Now, <laughs> you mean do I give my identity to a computer and let it deal with the rest of my life or I actually maintain my own identity? Yeah, yeah. Am I no longer a person? I'm a number, so therefore the machines are going to rule the world? I mean, we're coming to Skynet because of this? No, I don't, I don't think it's... I mean, you're a number as far as you're... You know, you're a number as far as paying taxes, and, you know, I mean... We actually, no, wait, that, that's a bad example because none of us like to pay taxes. But, you know, in, in many guises, we are just numbers. You're a number when you go and purchase things with your credit card, you know. And at that point, one of the interesting things that the credit card industry has done is found out a way to compute a number for you without betraying any private information, which uh, summarizes risk. I think um, this scenario, which is very close to my heart, having spent too much time going through airport security, um, you know, it ought to be able to be possible to to present credentials which identify you, um, and then which uh, which allow you know appropriate individuals to to gain information related to you, but without any access to private information. And these systems have been developed for a while, but you know we're a long way off there, I think, from them being deployed. So I actually, APTs to me are, are really different than the. the our old style attacks, I mean, they've been around forever. What's really interesting now is um, people call them blended attacks, they call them chained attacks, where it's no longer just, I've, I've spearfished, I got your information. Now it's making use of that information in other systems yeah. to chain an attack to an attack to an attack to an attack and just keeps on going. Yes. Yeah. So and even if we had, re if we everybody was didn't know their quote unquote identity, if they could break that software with a, such an attack, we're basically up a creek. That's true. You know, and and so look, ultimately, we have we have a we have a massive problem in general. But look, my, the reason I I left Citrix to go and start Bromium was because, to my mind. The biggest problem with the adoption of cloud anything is security, and um, unless we can get a good, a better handle on it, uh, it's going nowhere. All we'll do with uh, all everything we've spoken about in terms of cloud will basically just be parlayed into better ways of ordering the, automating IT within the enterprise. Everything that we think of as cloud will just be my private cloud, 
and you know we won't really move towards a better system overall. And and you're right, all of these are fundamental challenges that we have to tackle. Um, you know, to my mind, th there are others. Obviously, um, you said we're just going back to the SaaS thing. Um, you know, how many people just use Dropbox anyway? You know, so how much corporate data is going out without the corporation knowing about it? And um, yeah, you know, so that's the other one: is is corporate information is flying out the out the door uh, faster than you can think about? Isn't it, it is encrypted? <laughs> well, right. So, you can encrypt it, but so they encrypt it with keys that they own, but that doesn't—that does, that's not great. Um, that's why a lot of company, uh, a lot of even it was that even right. Even a yes. lot of companies, what they do internally is disable all encryption so that nothing gets encrypted. The reason why they do this is so their IDS, IPS, DLP filters can actually track back any of this stuff. Once they find something that is encrypted, it throws up a big red flag, which yeah. is actually a major hurdle for security because ideally we want to encrypt everything. Correct. We want data in flight to be encrypted, not unencrypted, which means well, we but, do but do that. This is Michael. We can encrypt inside certain boundaries in the enterprise. What we don't like is unidentified encrypted streams of traffic egressing the corporate data center. Exactly, that's, but with the that's cloud, where we get the nervous. But where's the right. corporate data center in the cloud? Well, I think that's where we're having this conversation is that we, we want to be able to extend the corporation not only into like a pseudo cloud where I'm taking a private cloud piece and I'm putting it in Terramark or Rackspace or Amazon, but what I'm really doing is participating in a public cloud but if I'm going to participate in a public cloud, then yeah, absolutely, I have to encrypt between my corporate data center and the cloud. And probably I have to encrypt in the cloud. But then we do have these authentication, key management, attribution, and non-repudiation issues. And then once we get our data into the cloud, we have to worry about lawful intercept and all kinds of other stuff that may occur on the cloud provider side. Okay. But you know the funny the, the funny tension here is that you know we as consumers are woeful at this stuff. I mean, look at how readily we put stuff up on Facebook and so on. And um, if you look at the vast majority of attacks on even the so-called private cloud, it comes through compromised client, and the compromised <laughs> the kind is compromised courtesy of my consumer behaviors. That is. You know, the enterprise can try and lock it down as much as it wants, but eventually there's something, you know, which will come in from the outside. And at that point, the client becomes the point of attack for the enterprise. And um, so, for example, look at the RSA attack. The RSA attack was a flash vulnerability, I believe. Um, the first Google attack, Gmail attack from China used IE6. So the vast majority of attacks don't happen you know, by people walking into some cloud-based data center and stealing the stuff. But yeah, they don't and there's a lot of um, anymore. That's the problem. <laughs> there's a lot more concern now for insider threats as well. I, I just keep seeing that. It used to be it wasn't really that much of a concern in enterprises, uh, just talked about, but now it's actually um, being actually, looked at. It was always okay. a big concern, but the Verizon breach reports yeah. proved that it was not. Fair enough. Now... But the, is it becoming more of an issue? Well, it's more of an issue, I think, because the insider is often not who you think they are anymore. Right? Well, that's the thing with, uh, with the Dropbox vulnerabilities is they say they encrypt everything, but there might be people within that organization which are now insiders. You've Basically, cloud is giving up control of certain aspects of your infrastructure. So if you give up control of your encryption keys to Dropbox, now you have to trust that they're doing it. So now the insider threat extends out to them. Well, right. I, I mean, I think any notion of giving your keys to the cloud provider should be considered absolutely heinous as a crime. You need to own your keys whenever the, whenever any operation happens on your data in the cloud. You need to provide the key right there and then. All data, all data needs to be encrypted at rest all the time. And, is it, 
Isn't the analogy the same as um, hiring a security firm to patrol your property? They're going to have keys to give them access to every room in your building. Yeah, but there must be some level of trust. They have bonded. You know, there's some responsibility they have to maintain that, that trust. Yeah, but with a security firm, you can make sure you have that bonded trust. With a well, but, but, but how, big, I mean, well, how big is the bond that you need on your corporate data? I mean, for, you know, for, for federal, there's no notion of a bond. You know? If the bad guys get the data, we're in trouble. So you yeah. have your own army patrol your your <laughs> bases. Well, which no, is why I like some of the cloud providers I've been working with, like Carpathia, <coughs> because they host a bunch of these, you know, very highly secure, top secret federal workloads. And if you want it then as a, as a normal enterprise to, uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that the feds have already put guys outside the data center with machine guns, you should go stick your stuff in their data center. Right. But that's not good enough anymore even. Because no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I agree. It's not nearly good enough. Because uh, what's happening is, is you have no idea whether or not that administrator has been social engineered or social hacked whether or not that administrator is trustworthy. All you have is somebody's word. Now, for I mean, if there was a mechanism to verify administrators, and for certain clouds there absolutely is. It's, if you have a cloud in the public sector, and Michael, you could probably attest to this, everybody that's an admin has gone through probably quite a bit of a backup check. Well, it's, it's, you know, they, my, don't get, they don't get this little card, like the little cat card, unless they've actually gone through it. My problem with all of these, uh, so I, I, at the end of the day, you can pretend that you, well, you can do better and better training and all these sorts of things, and eventually it is down to a human and their fallibility, okay? It's always human error. And, you know, it could be me clicking on, a, on an email attachment and, we all go down, right? And I could have been trained, and so on and so on. And so, actually, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, my view on this is that there is no way ever to assert any code is any good. Oh, come on. And, no, um, no, and, no, and no, or, no, that no, we can't talk over each other. Kind of, it's a free. Sorry, even, guys. Even, even first, let's let Simon finish his thought, then you can comment. Oh no, no, sorry. I mean, it's, my 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 thesis is that basically you cannot assume that humans are infallible or that they are trustworthy, no matter how much you how much, no matter how much you train them. There are always going to be all vulnerabilities there. Okay, even, even. Yes, sir. Your now your rebuttal or response or question or comment. Well, we, we definitely need to automate the controls that are put in place, and this is all about defense in depth. If, I agree if you're giving up your keys to a, a guard, for, so to speak, and you don't have any control over what they do or monitoring of their activities, then you're going to leave yourself open. But if the guard knows he's being watched and every activity is tracked, then we'll be able to trust him better. Well, I want to take that one step further. I, I, I just never want to say... Let me add on that, and then I'll let you finish. So in the teller in the bank, as all this money that is at their desk, they can give it to the customer. And as long as everything adds up at the end of the day, the videos which are being recorded of their activity are erased. But if there's any discrepancy in what happened, you go back, you look at the videotape, and you see where the mistake was made or if someone stole something or what happened. You try to see what's going on. That's why there's so many cameras there watching what they're doing. We need a similar thing for software-based cloud services. The problem is that the problem is that I mean the bank teller example is is okay because there's only a few thousand dollars there and it's not such a big deal if you lose it. But if you the problem with enterprise data is that one glitch and the whole thing's gone. Look at RSA. I mean one glitch, one employee, one vulnerability, and you lose the RSA seat. Right? That's a big deal. And so <clears throat> the the challenge is to you know is to provide adequate control when you don't really get the benefit of hindsight and and fixing it again later. That's the point. We so what's the to... solution? Do we drop, do we uh, disallow access to services like Dropbox because we don't have the controls in place there? Absolutely. So we so have, we'll, we have to be, to, uh, I can tell you what Citrix, Citrix has done. To my mind, you know, we have to, I, I think we've got to, 
face the fact that employees are using these things, and therefore we have to impose some degree of control, which is that all data that is in there is encrypted using keys that the enterprise owns, and um, that the data is therefore useless without that key. Um, but, but you can't prevent the site attack. So you have an email going to the iPad. You open the attachment with the business plan or the secret document, and you save it to Dropbox right on the iPad. How can you prevent that from happening? You have to have um, a yep. system where you don't have a single point of failure like that. Exactly. I, I, I don't know the answer to that specific question, even because I haven't thought about iPad issues as deeply as would be necessary to answer it. But we have a big problem. I don't know if we just came up previously, but something I've been thinking about a lot lately, in that we have, from a security point of view, these single points of failure, you know, throughout our computing infrastructure. You know, private manning was a single point of failure. Uh, he didn't have to be. Uh, this issue with Dropbox, you're, you're bringing up, sounds like a single point of failure. You know, we have to, in protecting our data, engineer the protections around it so there isn't a single point of failure. Just like there aren't single points of failure in airplanes or single points of failure in, you know, bridges or tunnels. Um, it's really kind of astounding when you look at the modern data center from a security point of view and you realize that all of that data, um, whether it's you know, RSA's crown jewels or Catbird's crown jewels or in some cases our federal government's most secret data, um, is subject to a single point of failure, you know, sometimes the weakest link being that one person. Yeah, so, so let me have a crack at it. So I've been thinking about this a lot. I agree with you. I think that's absolutely the the problem is we have this challenge of multi-tenancy of code and data. So uh, think about the <clears throat> think about the you know me sitting on my PC. I browse to hundreds or thousands of websites, and I process enterprise data all on one big blob of code called Windows, which is 60 million lines of code. That is nuts. And so, you know, the multi-tenancy problem there is that I have an infinite set of of potential trust sources, some of which are good and some of which are bad. And and they are all tried to be binned into relatively weak binning structures within my client operating system. Um, my user ID, my process ID, my whatever, right? File access permissions, various other things, all of which are extremely vulnerable, relatively weakly specified, generally weakly implemented and with many vulnerabilities. And so the problem is that we have these um, <clears throat> single points of failure, as you, as you said, uh, where too many things from too many different trust zones converge on a single piece of vulnerable infrastructure. That has to get fixed. So, the, um, I, to, to comment to what Eben said, well, can I put Dropbox off my iPad, for example? Of course you can use it. But you are, you have to make an intelligent choice. For example, I don't use Dropbox on my iPad. I do not use any type of data sharing on my iPad unless I am in, inside my corporate bastion. Okay, but Ed, you're a security professional. I mean, you know. So are you. Trust something, unless you uh, have tested it and you you know that you can trust it. So you don't but trust. This is also you know. education of the users. The users have to be educated. Well, not Absolutely only that, but are there controls? It. Is it going too far in an organization at this point to audit the applications which are on the corporate-issued iPads? Absolutely. That's going it's too far, or is that reasonable? That's reasonable. If it's corporate-issued, guaranteed I'll audit it. So I don't know that organizations have that sort of uh, <laughs> culture right now where they can they have take it for the iPad devices. or even personal computer that – you know, they have bring your own. What was Citrix all about? Bring your own device, right? Yeah, Simon? Eben's right. A lot of companies are just letting you bring in whatever you want to bring in. Exactly, and that. I well, but control. and then you control access at, at at the VDI level. So maybe VDI is the solution. It, it's, oh, a it's part it's, of a solution. It's it's part of a solution. It's better, but it's not great. I mean, look, you can run my corporate desktop in the data center, and I'll be accessing Outlook there and somebody will still send me a poisoned email link. And by the way, when I click on that, where is that exploit going to go? Oh, gosh, now it's running around inside my data center. That's the last place I want the darn thing. Exactly. So, you know, the fundamental problem is this multi-tenancy notion. And you know what training uses? We all say it. It's not 
it's not achievable. That is, we are all subject to the fact that we were on a plane last night, we wake up this morning, click on a thing, and it's too late. We are humans, and, and better training isn't going to really deal with that fallibility. So to my mind, you know, we have to change it. I mean, by the way, I'm kind of starting to tell you the story about why I decided to go and do my bit at Bromium. Um, and what Bromium is. Well, so Bromium is, is, Bromium is taking a view that, that virtualization technology is the best way to achieve better isolation. So if you take this multi-tenancy problem that I described, the problem is one of too much code, weak interfaces, and you know too many different things jamming themselves into it and trying to get out again and attack each other. If you can find a way using virtualization technology to, at a very granular level, isolate running code, then you can force all communication paths through a very, uh, a very narrow interface designed for security specifically with security in mind, um, which is, you know, any I.O. and so on always has to go through a thing, which is a highly secured hypervisor. And the last two years of, of my working life at Citrix, basically we, 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 were, we were working on, on this thing called Zen Client, which is a, um, a highly secure embedded uh, Zen hypervisor um, whose specific goal is to provide you know, attestation, trust, everything encrypted at rest, um, and to really minimize vulnerabilities. And learned a lot in working with various government agencies on that project. The whole goal here is to try and make that, to, to, to look, use virtualization technology for the first time specifically to change the odds in security. And then let's, let's go back to when we, on, on our chat, we have um, um, one of our guests, and actually doesn't have his name here, I think his name is Phil, said that his motto is don't say no, but say yes, and here is how, provide solutions as the only long-term viable avenue. And he's absolutely right. You know, we're all about solutions, and the hypervisor is not the only solution out there. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's not. And by the way, it's not sufficient anyway. Um, but I think if it can, I mean, that is, there isn't a, 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 secu a security panacea at all. Certainly for specific use cases, if you can granularly, if you can get a very granular co uh, control in terms of boundaries uh, between code of different trust levels, then you can stop some of these kind of pollution attacks where code manages to escalate its privilege and attack other things. And uh, so that's kind of, that, that's basically what Bromium is going after. It's useful in a cloud context and it's useful in a client context, but I would certainly agree that it's not a panacea. So can you give us an idea of um, how there might, what types of solutions might come out of that? Um, like, yeah, so I mean, Bram has got a lot space? of work to do. You said hypervisors. Yeah, so, so. Br I mean, we are, so the, the company, the core founders, the founders of the company is myself, Ian Pratt, who's still chairman of Zen.org, a guy called Gora Banga, who uh, you might recall a product called Phoenix Hyperspace which was an embedded Zen hypervisor that Phoenix produced to facilitate um, you know, multiple guest types on, on, on a single client. That, by the way, is now, uh, that, that asset was purchased by HP. And when HP is talking about WebOS on every PC, it, that's, tech, that, that's that technology. So basically, the, the goal here is to just forget everything you know about hypervisor today in the form of VSX and Zen server and, and everything else. It's simply, if you, if you said, if I said to you, hey, you have, look at a PC today, you've got this amazing thing called VT, which if you pr appropriately manipulate it, which requires a hypervisor, allows you to ensure that whenever a piece of code is executing and does something that you are worried about, that it will have to stop. The hardware will stop it, and then it will have to ask to do something else like get access to a file, get, send a packet, receive a packet, uh, copy and paste, uh, whatever, right? So if you can appropriately manipulate the, uh, the trust level, that is subject to the trust that, that you have in a particular piece of code and or its data that it's consuming or producing, 
you can force any piece of code to stop instantly courtesy of VT. Okay? And then you can force any interaction with the outside world to occur via an extremely narrow interface, which can be designed with security in mind. There's about five things you could do. Send or receive a packet, put or, put or get a block of data, copy, paste, get memory, put memory, and so on. There's, and you can design that interface. It's about 10,000 lines of code, and you can divide it to make sure that it's secure. At that point, you have an excruciatingly detailed insight into what is going on in a piece of code. So, for example, you could get very granular control for DLP. Um, because you know exactly what is going into or out of any piece of code. And um, more See, of Simon, you're talking about changing the rules of DLP, so because right now DLP is about into and out of the corporate environment or the secure bastion. Correct. Now you're talking about into and out of any piece of code, which is actually much, 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 much more granular. Correct. You could actually probably say this is into and out of if we're talking about code, I could be talking about into and out of a particular processor or code that's down on. You know. Yeah, or a particular application, say, right? That, that is, Copy paste at, point, at that point, you know what code is running, and you can you can say, oh, this is Outlook, and it happens to want to read your RSA key file or whatever it is, right? And so you, have, you the, the goal here, the idea here, and by the way, it's mostly still ideas. Hold on before you get there, Mike. Go ahead. Is saying something? Yeah, I'd love to see DLP for a copy paste buffer. Oh, good lord! Exactly yeah. right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That, is, that's what Bromium's t trying to create. Yeah. Okay. So we need to have well, so OCR right now, Bromium is <laughs> only one person at a time. Simon. Sorry, Bromium is uh, so Bromium is some core IP, which is around how you could use hardware virtualization technology and a hypervisor to get this granular explicit control. There's a calculus for trust, which allows you to. We assume that that even if the code is good, that is. Even if it's the, the copy of the code that you signed off on and whitelisted and said, go use it, that it's always vulnerable and therefore nothing can be trusted. That is, any piece of code with the right piece of data can be turned into an attack vector, for example, <laughs> Outlook, right? Okay. And, and <clears throat> so even, just, even signed code has bugs. <laughs> well, yeah. all code <laughs> has bugs. I mean, I to, once taught a security yeah, coding but, class and I asked people how many, how many lines of code they've ever written in their lives. Someone raised their hand and said 30,000, and everybody in the class just turned around and looked at them and said, really, guy? And there's no way. Right. No, I, I'm, we're in violent I, agreement on that. I think I've written 10 code, ten lines of code that have been absolutely secure. Right, right. So <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. So then what you want to do is, you, you, you know, you have this idea that you know, the code is executing. You have an ability to get this very granular control over it. And then you get to see what data it's consuming. Again, you have an opportunity to influence whether or not consume data, or you can bias your notion of trust given what it's doing. So, for example, suppose my supposedly lockdown browser suddenly goes to some site .ru or whatever, right? At that point, I can move out and say I don't trust you at all, and you know, from then on, it doesn't get to, to touch any other data and so on. So, so let's look at this from a I mean, so from a hypervisor perspective. I mean, this is something that could literally just run within the VM or be part of the VM body, the VM object, right? Uh, Not something that would literally live in the the operating system. Well, so the key thing here is that it, <clears throat> the hypervisor then becomes the most fundamental piece of control logic in the system. Well, it, it is that already, by the way. I mean. Yeah. We just, you know, <laughs> one is always very cautious uh, in terms of saying that the hypervisor is the new OS because it isn't, and hopefully we never go there, but it is the most privileged logic on the system. Um, and so, and specifically in, in the Bromium case, it is chartered with the goal of security. Okay. That is, it's not trying to do, it's not trying to do server consolidation or you know, live reload or anything else. It's the specific goal of this kind of hypervisor is to, is to is to get a very granular control of execution and force all I/O through a very narrow secure interface, which you can then police and manipulate using a formal calculus of trust. So thinking about this way, 
let's take our initial conversation about software as a service. If we applied this logic to that, I have my endpoint. Let's say it's my iPad. So if I had a tool like that on my iPad, my iPad could go off and say, hey, you know, you're not allowed to open that mail with that attachment on this iPad. Correct. So, or you are, and then it's like, okay, I can go, now I can go to my bastion, my, into my data center or wherever it is I'm going. I can get that credential that I can't see. Would, wouldn't you be better off in that case for devices that you may or may not have full control over to not allow sensitive information in an, in an email? Yeah, but you, I mean, if, if it came in from a third party, you would never know. Well, if it came in from a third party, you can send it through DLP if it's... Yeah, but you're talking about something going through a bastion host like my corporate environment. How many people have email that use Google, Hotmail, whatnot? I mean, if people can't send me email through my normal account for whatever reason, they turn around and send it through one of my Gmail or Hotmail accounts. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Although, although, and that's uh, have, that happens to everybody. Well, they'll tweet it to you, and you'll click on the link. Exactly. So hold on, guys. There's a couple of things here. So if we're talking about a DLP solution and it, we're using VDI, that, that would not be allowed. Again, I, yeah. I, that wasn't, that wasn't the, the assumption is you're not using that quite yet. You're not there. So we've done the click on – we've opened up the email that says I have to do X, Y, and Z. Click on this link. Okay, sure. I copy the link. I then open up my view session on my iPad, which I can do. I then get to my corporate environment and paste that link into my browser inside my VDI. Guess what? That shouldn't be allowed either. No, that's right. Yeah, you're toast at that point again. You're toast at that point because now I brought the bad site in. So now right. DLP should fire and say, hey, you can't do this. When we had, that's right. When what I had, a, we had um, cloud we had one of the security as a service vendors, they were basically, there's a couple of different models of that. One is, is they go off and do all the heavy lifting in the cloud and say, yep, nope, that's a bad address. Or they'll do a DLP bastion solution where it says, well, you have to go through us to go anywhere else, and they would prevent it. So what you're talking about, Simon, is moving something even closer to the hypervisor to not even allow that on the network. Uh, right, that's a potential thing. Um, the, the other thing, so, but, but there's, another, there's another interesting observation one can make, which is that at the end of the day, there will always be the thing that the Bastion or the DLP system has never seen before. That is, if you look at the, you know, the, the, most, the worst kinds of attacks are the zero days, and you have no idea that it's an attack. Um, and, and so ultimately, how do you defend against that? Well, You've got to say that all code is potentially vulnerable, and even you know, known code with the good intentions, when combined with some bad piece of data, could turn into an attack vector. And so, and and by the way, you can never decide if it's an attack until that code is executed. So, I mean, we're getting to the problem. I mean, like um, one of the companies I was talking about was Cloud Passage. They do all the heavy lifting in their secure cloud by transmitting the data across for, for very specific things. It's not a Are they the ones that do the SSL checks? No, they do more than that. That's um, The SSL checks is done by, I use them, so um, uh, trust here. Oh, that's right. But it's something similar but for other applications, Cloud Passage? No, Cloud Passage, when we had, we had Cloud Passage on the podcast a while, uh, not too long ago, and they were talking about, right now they control Linux-based firewalls inside of Amazon so that you could literally control your virtual machine That's right. firewall from a central location. They're expanding that to be vulnerability management and things of that nature. So it will be a full, a full suite. So one of the things that's happening with all these new capabilities, we're, we're building these tools that have these new capabilities, but... How are the rules going to be managed for those various tools? Is it going to be more automated or more dynamic, kind of like artificial intelligence based? Or are we going to have to, like we did with old firewalls, you know, specifically say this machine, that application, this file name can't do this? How, how's that going to work? Is there a better way to do it? Well, Michael, you were mentioning something on chat. Why don't you tell us all? Well, I've done a lot of things on the chat, but to respond to Evans and maybe Eddie can point out which comment it was you're referring to. I think we have to do, yeah, we have to we have to do a lot more with um, policy-driven. So 
solutions right. and automation and, you know, a new term of art that I'm seeing around, but I'm not a fan of this word, is orchestration. I think it's too complicated a word, so we have no, to talk like smart the and, 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 and behavior. Call it again, fuzzy logic. Logic. over each other. Simon, yeah. uh, Simon, you were saying something? No, not me. Michael? I think it was Mike Foley. And, Mike? and behavior. Behavior. Yeah. Okay. I mean, one of the things one of the things about zero days and some of these weird URLs is I I, I would love to have a filter on my uh, on my URL stream where if my filter saw a URL it had never ever seen before, so some sort of learning filter. Uh, I think that'd be useful too because a lot of this malware stuff, uh, certainly the malicious URLs. One of the things that is very distinct about them is their new URLs. So that's what I'm kind of getting at, and that's and you guys maybe know more about what's going on out there. Is say I'm a, I want to use these new tools, but I don't have all the experience to know what's good or bad. Is there a service somewhere where I can say, you know, I don't want to build my own rules for policy. I want to use the industry standard ones for HIPAA or for PCI or for something hold else. Hold it, hold it. Let's hold it. Let's step back a second. Compliance rules are not security, so therefore using compliance policy rules is, yes, a good start, but I'll guarantee you it won't give you security. You will be still spearfished. Sure. There are no, there are no national database. I mean, there's probably a national database somewhere of this, but I don't know one <laughs> that basically has, like, the well-known, let's go ahead and accept these. These are bad policy rules. There's, there's none. Isn't that kind of what MITRE is trying to do a little bit? No. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to disagree with it. I think there are – the problem is we're not using them well. I think yeah. there are a lot of good sources for these big databases. I mean, um, what I usually refer to as the Darknet Project, which is you know run by Team Kimru and uh, Arbornet and Catbird and many other people participate. Right. Um, you know, FireEye uh, uh, is another commercial company. I, I, I think they participate or they have a different group they participate with. There are these places. I think we're just not really coordinating them well. Well, there are too um, many repositories of policy. I think that's one channel. That, that so for example, too, exactly. I mean, I get I get told by everybody, oh, I've got this policy system, this policy system. I'm going to write it in Microsoft GPOs or whatever in AD. And the problem is actually that policy is actually a programming language. Let's, let's just be real, right? You're programming logic about what to do with these various forms of data that might come flying past. And there again, you have vulnerabilities. That is, often the, the policies are as buggy as the, <laughs> the code that they're trying to protect, because again, it's written by humans. And so I worry about the complexity of policy and the fact that we aren't really making much progress. There are too many different sources of policy, all of which conflict with each other. Like, I mean, we can look at one policy, for example. DISA has a policy for password control that's different than SANS, I mean, the, the, uh, which I'm sorry, which is different than CIS security, which is different than my corporate ones. You know, who wins? Who's right? That's well, a simple I would choose one, one of them as a starting point and then adjust it. You know, the user complains that you're too tight, I can't get my work done, then I might loosen it up a little bit. Or I get an attack or a vulnerability and I might tighten it down a little more. But I got to have some place to start that, to kind of get the ball rolling is what I'm saying. I don't want to have to build all these rules from scratch. No, I think everybody agrees. That I think what I'm hearing is everybody agrees, but it's somebody point me to the definitive set of policy. And the problem is there are too many. I mean, so wait, right now, Bramium, we're building a system which can be very can be driven by policy at a very granular level. I go to customers and I say, all right, who? What's the thing that's going to drive this? In other what's words, what's your I, security policy and what are your security standards? And then yeah, we'll help I, build. A I get about ten different answers. And a lot of times the companies don't even have it, or they're like, well, this is what's written down, but we don't do that. Yeah, actually the policy is sometimes a piece of, it's a book full of paper. Exactly, on a, on a shelf. So that's what I'm getting at, is it seems like when we talk about software as a service and now we have all these new capabilities and tools, we need an organization or, you know, there's companies paying, I, I heard uh, Symantec or Oracle or whoever is using that software, the, honey, the Hornet's Nest stuff. We, yeah. We're willing to pay to have somebody tell us what's good and bad, but it seems like that service is coming available now, or not, is it? It is, but the, the challenge, of course, is that you know, the notion of good and bad is not static either. 
I mean, the attacks are adapting extremely fast. This, let me, uh, I mean, it's certainly in the, in the client OS malware category, it is, it's now proven, and we shouldn't be surprised by this, by the way, it's called the halting problem in computer science, that malware can adapt and change faster than you could ever uh, uh, you know, identify. That is, it's an NP-complete problem to decide whether or not any piece of, uh, you know, any piece of code is, is malicious or not. And, and so, you know, Moore's Law, generating more, giving more and more cycles, uh, you know, both to us as well as to the bad guys, to adapt and, and hide themselves. So anything which is based on blacklisting is going to have vulnerabilities. At any point in time, it's good to have blacklisting to cover the known vulnerabilities, but there's always the one that you've never seen before. So how we, we need to have adaptive controls, and that's what we've done with antivirus software is we get new signatures every hour, and as new zero-day attacks are reported, they update their signatures, and we hope we can get a new signature by the time it spreads to someone in our organization. Yeah, but by even by that time that you've actually gotten a signature, it's already had an hour to spread. So we should you may it. find it, but you may not be able to kill it. That's the problem without reason. I mean, but once you get infected, getting a virus removed is extremely difficult without reinstalling from scratch. We all know that. It's going to put itself wherever it needs to address. So preventing, getting a signature, signature-based thing are basically after the horse has left the barn. So we lost right. the barn. That's right. The signature files by now are so big that they're almost impossible to distribute, you know, in real time at any scale. I mean, so there's a huge challenge there. By the way, there are, none of the signature-based methods work in the VDI world either because, you know, they don't. They, um, there are all sorts of challenges there. So here's a simple one, for example. You know, they all assume that they, you know, I get a new signature file. What, are the, what does the AV thing do? It goes and pokes around the hard disk. Where's the hard disk in VDI? It's on the other side of the data center. So 120, 150 VMs on a server all suddenly try and pull their hard disk onto the server to find the bad guys in, in their hard disk. And you know what? Everything falls over. So there are major challenges in all of that stuff. So yeah, is, am I hearing that with uh, hypervisor-based solutions, we were able to get closer to the information so we can switch to more proactive instead of a reactive type of process? Um, the hope that we have, and it is that because we haven't got a product out, and um, is that what you can do is have this, this de minimis assumption, which is that everything is vulnerable, there is always going to be something that you've never seen before, and therefore you need to be able to deal with it. Now, how do you deal with something you've never seen before? Well, here's this piece of code. It was known good code that it was signed by somebody, and it went and processed a piece of data from someplace. Um, what do I know about the data? I might know something about the provenance of the data. If I do, then it helps me decide whether or not I trust it. But certainly if I know nothing about the data, my best possible course is to assume that the, the trusted piece of code producing now consuming uh, untrusted data is now of a zero trust category. And so when it now tries to do something to the system, read a file, write a file, whatever it is, I can say, well, I don't trust you. And, um, and then I can have the appropriate you know, kind of categorize, I can bin it and say, gosh, here's a piece of untrusted stuff now trying to do this additional thing, like reach for a file or, you know, uh, write, send a packet up into the Internet or whatever it happens to be. At that point, I have a far more granular notion of whether or not I can permit an activity to, to occur or not. I'm also in the path of execution. That is, I can always stop it right there and then um, before it executes. Um, so, you know, we get a more granular point of control. Uh, we get a, a simple view of trust, which is that the basic assumption is that if you don't know enough, then it's untrusted, and that you then, you know, you have to do something superhuman, that is some positive system has to say, yep, this is the thing that you really can trust before I will let it do something which could be bad. But, you know, there's a long way to go down that path still. Oh, I would say there is. Right. 
What do you think about uh, automated sandboxing and then characterization of that code? Uh, nesting the hypervisor, if you will, and then running that code inside the uh, nested instance so you can maybe characterize what it's doing. I, I don't know what characterization really, I mean, I, so Sydney, that is another approach to getting more granular control, more granular views as to whether or not a particular piece of code is good or bad, or it's code plus data, right? Because code can be good, it's just when you give it the bad data that it goes bad. Witness the browser being one of them. Um, so it's another approach to getting a more granular view of what's going on. So, you know, I think we need to go and push on all of these things and see how far we can take it. Sandboxing in general as a, as a process has been fraught with difficulty in the sense that the sandboxing interface has been is huge. So even look at, say, Chrome, uh, you know, Chrome, which is, they've done a pretty good job on Chrome, but it still has vulnerabilities. Um, you know, you basically end up rewriting Windows inside of Windows to get Chrome to work, and then you still don't know whether you've done it a good enough job of it. And that basically just comes down to the porosity of the interface that you have to police, and, and it's very, very difficult to do that. So I have some hope that people will make progress there. Bromium's trying to tackle it from the other end by saying, uh, gosh, that's an impossibly hard task. We'll do something we know we can do, and that thing we know we can do is uh, is essentially arrest code execution arbitrarily at the lowest possible level in the system courtesy of a hypervisor and VT. So how do you tie this back to our initial discussion on identity? Uh, hmm. Well, in order to arrest the code, they need to identify the person doing it and the, what they're doing. I would say. As a well, here's the point I, I, I was thinking I would make here, because we were talking about this. I thought this was the one you were referring to, Ed. The problem with insider threat today is that through spear phishing or attacks through you know social network sites or other attacks, your trusted insider gets compromised by the bad guy. Yeah. Right now the bad guy has the, the identity of your trusted insider. That's why the trusted insider threat is now a lot worse than it used to be. So if Simon's technology, or I'll say Bromium, sorry, if Bromium is looking at how to make that, that insider's endpoint more secure so that insider is less easy to compromise, I'll say, then, then we can trust them more, right, or, or at least believe they are who they say they are when they're taking the actions they're taking. Is that or, right? Or you can have a better system of policy which could get more grand control over execution there and reduce some, to some extent the threats. Right, I, I could see it giving uh, much greater granularity to enforcing least privilege. Correct. So Mike, you were, Mike Foley, you were mentioning that you think that we should tie behavior analysis to this as well? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be no one solution that, that someone can install and say, yep, I'm secure. It's always going to be changing, and one of the things I think we need to start looking at is is behavior. So behavior might be something along the lines of, um, you know, Mike Foley rarely ever creates VMs at three in the morning on a Saturday morning from Romania. Therefore, yeah. I'm going to stop him from creating VMs, or I'm going to challenge him for additional credentials. It's it's okay. that level of of things that we, we need to start doing, start raising the ante up when you're doing things that are kind of um, uh, out, out of your normal behavior. Right. So and I'm still just, saying the same thing. Uh, this is my, my question with this is how do you learn what the good behavior is? Is there a learning mode that these systems have? Yeah, so I was yesterday I went to a presentation by um, Silvertail Systems, and Silvertail, they're, they're also funded by Andreessen Horowitz. And so, look, in, in general, there, is a, there are all sorts of st statistical ways to learn stuff, and they do a very sophisticated statistical multivariate correlation analysis on web traffic uh, just by sitting on a spanning port, and then they can find things which look anomalous. And this business of finding anomalies is the business of building detectors, <clears throat> which, um, you know, try and say this is good and this is bad. But this is, by the way, the same sort of problem that you find across medical science as well as security and everything else. The problem with any, any learning system is that you, 
you, you know, you might have a, an ability to detect with 100% accuracy um, the bad guy, but the, the biggest problem is always what are the false positives, right? What's the false positive, right? Because any detector, you know, th there's, there is a chance that it, it, it detects normal behavior and says that it is anomalous, okay? And or it may detect that one-time behavior because, you know, you are now allowed to do X, Y, and Z, so you go off and do yeah. it. And it detects that as anomalous, therefore it's, you're, you're a bad guy. Right. It, because it doesn't know what behavior you're, it doesn't know, it may not know what you were just allowed to do. So right, so here, here I'll give be. you an example. Uh, when I was at Intel, they developed a system which was awesome at, at finding attackers on PCs because it would observe, you know, I found connection rates and everything else. And so they could show that this PC, when you connected it to a network and it was being attacked by viruses, it would 100% detect all the known viruses uh, and was very good at learning. The problem was that if you used it to browse the web and just normal web traffic was coming through this thing, it would also sometimes say, oh my goodness, you're an attacker and turn your PC off. That's right. Well, that's that that's kind of a brute force approach. What you want to do, what you want what you want what you want to do is say uh, is pop up saying, "Are you really who you are?" What do you want to know? And so, in general, any any detector has the problem of false positives. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And and so, all of these learning systems um, have the risk that if they generate sufficiently large numbers of false positives, the human operator just says, "Ah, you know, this system's always screwing up." I'm going to ignore it. And um, by, by the way, in the Wiki, in um, you know the, the WikiLeaks thing, where you know the data was, you know, downloaded and stuck on a CD and handed off to WikiLeaks, you know, there were logs saying that this was going on. <laughs> there were logs saying this was going on. It's just the log volumes were so great that the human operator is saying, yeah, whatever. There's just so much volume of data coming through this thing. I can't keep up with it, right? And so you're vulnerable to the fact that you know the alarm rate is is high enough that people begin to ignore the alarms. And so the quality of the detectors is extremely important in the, the building such learning systems. The, the detection has to be adaptable. And, yeah. with, and with that, i got to step off. Take care. Well, if the detector is detecting that many alarms, it needs to do something drastic or draconian anyway. <laughs> but you actually need a human or some other system that's out of band in line to say, hey, that was really my normal job. And then yeah, it, so the, it needs to be an out of an out of band mechanism. And that's the problem with a lot of stuff today is that they're doing a lot of their detecting and then notification and then verification in the same band that they're doing the detecting on. This is a question I have. Is that a one time setup task or is that an ongoing management or operations task? And is it it's done in house? operations task. I mean, if I go. Done and in house say, by a single team? Or would it be better served that a, um, a managed service that handles many enterprises handles something like that? I don't know if I want to go. Yeah, the problem with the managed, want, service, I mean, idea. managed service doing that. Yeah, exactly. The managed service problem is that. It generally requires that you disclose too much information to the manager, to the to the managed service provider, and um, you know therein you are, you know you're betraying too much information. That is, if the managed service provider is compromised, then you're compromised too. So you want to keep this something like that in house. So maybe the managed service provider is providing you the tool, but the actual decision to say yeah, allow that has to be done by somebody in your own organization. Either it's a person or an object or a thing. Because remember, it doesn't always have to be a person, it just has to be... Well, right, if the data is tokenized or encrypted... Correct. ...and the managed service provider doesn't have the, the key, and the user who's accessing the data through the managed service provider has to come back to corporate and establish their credentials to get the key, then you're still controlling that locally, even though all the data is in the cloud. And then going back to something really early on that we said, and that is, well, why should I give my keys out to any cloud provider? And the answer is, I should never give my keys out to a cloud provider. Exactly. I should we should have a valet key stuff. we can give out, right? Excuse me? We should have a valet key we can give out to the managed service provider for that one specific purpose. Perhaps. 
Absolutely. Enough to basically turn back the engine and say, yes, that's approved. I think that's I think that's a good statement. I don't know if they could create a valet key for this stuff. So last thoughts. We've gone a little over. Um, Simon, why don't you go first? Any last thoughts? Well, um, I've learned a lot, as, as I generally do when I talk to you guys, which is great, because my training is not, uh, not in security, and, uh, and I've, given, I've learned a whole bunch in terms of, um, you know, given me a lot of food for thought in terms of policy. Um, you know, but the last thought is that, is that blacklisting systems, things that are trying to continually be updated to point at the new problems, are going to lose, because the rate at which an attacker can adapt is the rate at which I could get any computation done in the cloud, <clears throat> which is far greater than the rate at which you can uh, adapt your systems. <coughs> so, you know, I just think that that whole place, that whole thing is a waste of time. It's kind of useful to know classes of attacks, but in general, blacklisting has failed, and uh, and that's just a, it's a fatality of Moore's law. Um, and whitelisting is good enough to a point, but it doesn't protect me against vulnerabilities. Okay. Um, Michael Berman, any last thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the areas we didn't touch on today, but still needs to be addressed, and I think it's a particular area of interest for you and I, is this idea of, you know, lawful intercept, forensic investigation. Um, if all the data is in the cloud and the cloud provider doesn't have a key, yeah, I mean, there's all these kind of issues that how do we cooperate when there's a lawful order to cooperate? I think that's one of the open questions. I think what we can do is follow that up with another podcast if I can find the right person. <laughs> so, um, even any last thoughts? Yeah, I'm always anxious, uh, excited to see new tools and capabilities being introduced. So I'm just concerned how we're going to manage all these new knobs we can twist. And I'm looking for an uh, easier-to-use knob turner someone I can hire to do that for me and all of my customers. Does anybody out there want to be a knob turner? <laughs> um, no? Okay. Um, if you do, even is looking for one, just send them an email or a tweet. He'll be glad to interview you. So, um, as <laughs> is that what you need, even Somebody to help you there? Yeah, I think that'd be great. Okay. We, we, we don't want to hand code these policies and rules anymore and keep them up to date. We want to tell somebody, hey, whatever you did yesterday is, is too tight, loosen it up. Okay. And my last thoughts is, is that, you know, identity in the cloud is still an issue. Going to a random set of keys or numbers or whatnot that obfuscate my identity does not necessarily mean I'm secure. I still don't know how I can map identity from when I log in to a cloud software as a service solution. And I still don't know how how that would how that would how anything at a lower level would impact that identity definition or how to do that. I, I still need to think about that. But um Simon, you've given me some interesting thoughts as well. Thank you. Well, I've learned a lot. Thanks very much. In terms of the identity mapping problem, I believe that there's various products that claim to be able to solve this. Certainly, Ping would say they can solve it. Citrix would say they can solve it with, their, uh, with the Netscaler cloud access piece. I think VMware is going down that path with Project Horizon. Um, Layer 7 also claims they can solve it. So there are various vendors heading off down that path, and I think probably all doing relatively rational things. Absolutely, and I've, I've talked to some of those already, and I think we're well on our way to getting the right answer. The question By the way, I think one of the key things on the, you know, even if you end up at this point where you have a, this identity problem nailed, a key thing that I think has to be in place is the zero trust anonymous identity. Absolutely. That, and that, but I don't, I don't think everybody gets that. That is, I think everybody needs to have an identity, possibly multiple identities on there. I want, certainly want a personal identity and I want a corporate identity and various other things. But, you know, I think one of the key 
promises of the internet in terms of its, its opportunity to promote democracy and everything require that there is this notion of open disclosure by, and, and anonymity, um, but then that comes with a level of trust and suspicion around it, right? You're absolutely right, and I think not only that, I think my data also has identity, so how do we manage its identity? Yes. So right. we're In order for me to people, have... Uh... But now I have data with identity, effectively, that identity could be its digital signature, which it should always have anyways when I'm putting stuff out into a cloud, because that's how I can manage whether or not it's been modified or changed on me when I don't have control over it anymore. Right. Yeah, I was just going to uh, second that. In order for there to be privacy in this future world, we have to be able to have anonymous identities or, you know, identities with limited attribution. Right. Right. And, of course, no one has to trust me when I'm using my anonymous identity. But in order to have any kind of privacy, I have to be able to have that. Right. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you very much, everybody, for a very intriguing and interesting uh, podcast. Simon, once more, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a great pleasure. And good, best of luck with Bromium. Thank you. And let me 